voices were breaking silence about a topic that wants to be shrouded in silence way too often. There's a bunch of people who really look different than one another, but who have a strand of commonality. And our strand of commonality is not just our hurts, it's our recovery, it's our healing. I sweat strength. Strength is in my pores. It encompasses all of me. Even my tears are strong. I've been through some scary things in my life, and they say that which doesn't kill us only makes us stronger. I'm here to tell you the story. As a young child growing up without a place to call home, living a nightmare with a woman whose first priority wasn't me, but her John's. Bouncing from one white foster home to the next, never knowing who I was or who I belonged to. Not even having the security to know if there would be a next meal. I think ending up in an abusive relationship and marriage was natural. Um, almost probably my destiny. I don't know necessarily all the details of my childhood abuse. I know it was significant. Um, so the um, foundation had already been set. I already knew abuse. I knew that better than I knew anything else. When I went away to college, I started dating a man who turned out to be a junkie. But oh, Leonard, he was a fine man. And in the beginning, he whined and he dined Miss Aretha. But he was an IV drug user. And eventually, I started using too. And that's when everything went to hell. The drug became the center of my world. I lost everything. I was put out of my house. The lights were turned off phone was turned off, but all I could think about was getting that next almighty high. I'd do just about anything for my drug, short of sell my body. And I guess that's some testimony to Leonard's decency, because he drew the line there too. But trouble continued. Leonard and I started shooting cocaine, and Leonard started hitting me. At first, Leonard was able to keep the violence in check and the bruises, well, they were covered by my clothing. But then I got pregnant. When I found out I was pregnant, I stopped using, but Leonard didn't. When I was about eight months pregnant, we got into a fight about something and Leonard was beating me. And I had to choose whether to protect my head or protect my stomach. I chose to protect my stomach. See, I figured if something had to be sacrificed, it would be my head and not my unborn child. After that, whenever I'd go for my prenatal checkup, I'd always ask the doctor, is the baby all right? Is the baby all right? And when Lenny was born, I knew a part of him wasn't all right. I looked at him, and he looked at me. And I knew he knew. See, Lenny had been a part of the violence for nine months. Of course he knew. When Lenny was just shy of a year old, another fight occurred, and he got caught in the crossfire and got knocked in the toilet. That was the day I left. See, it's one thing to beat the shit out of me, but you won't hurt my child. But it didn't end there. I got a protection from abuse order and Leonard got 302'd, but he kept stalking me. And one night he climbed through the window and he told me I had a choice. He said, Aretha, you can choose to give me some or you can choose to get your ass beat. Hell of a choice. I chose to give him some, but the funny thing is, he beat my ass anyways. 
Nine months after that rape, my second son, Andre, was born. The final episode happened when De Lenard had come to get the boys for a visit, and once again, we started arguing about something. Lenard raised his hand to strike me. I looked Lenard in the eyes, and I said, Lenard, I'm done taking your beatings. Now, you can hit me if you want to. And today, one of us will go to jail, and the other will go to the morgue, and I don't give a damn which one I am. Lenard walked away from me that day. And then the Lord started taking over my heart. See all that anger and that hatred? It was eating me up inside. Lenard is the father of my two sons, and if I give him nothing else, I give him that. I want Lenny and Andre to be able to look me in the eyes and know their mother never kept them from their father. I love Lenny and Andre more than anything in this world. And I would do anything for them, including making peace with their father. Was blind, but now I see. I was a child whose childhood was stolen, who sat with tense shoulders in the corners of rooms eating to dull the pain whose head was hit with frying pans, fingers held in electric fans, the one whose mother laughed about pulling her own arm out of its socket while trying to hit me at age one, and told this story over and over. A child stunted in creativity, robotic in emotion, a child who wasn't. I was a young adult. I married a loser, a man I thought I deserved this overweight woman who wasn't. I was only hit twice in those five years, but I was hit with his words every day. There were no bruises on the outside, and I couldn't see the bruises on the inside. So I accepted and expected abuse and created a world that was all my fault. Um, this was way too big for me to do on my own and ended up in therapy and was the best thing I ever did in my life. It was the first selfish, truly selfish thing that I ever did for me that was just for me. And it was the thing that saved my life because I was able to then start to really talk about what I experienced in my life growing up, about what I experienced in my marriage, that crazy five years that I spent with that guy, and why I thought that was all okay and why it wasn't, and who was I. And I, I used that therapeutic time to find out who I was and to, to allow that light that was buried so deep for so long to surface. When I was in social work school, I never dreamed I'd have this much space. All those shared desks and cubby halls. Mm, but here it is, and it is all mine. This is Ashley. It was the last school picture taken of her before the tragedy. Ashley used to always make sure that I got the big school picture, not the wallet size. See, Autumn was too little for school pictures, but here she is, the little imp. She used to always prance around and say, I, beautiful, I, a princess. So there they are, my girls. I started working with the family when Ashley was three, Justin was a baby, and Nicholas and Autumn were mere thoughts. Liz and Matt were struggling and reached out for help, and I was assigned the case. It was a pleasure. They were a neat young couple, high school sweethearts without a whole lot of coping skills. So we started working together to set goals and identify goals, and in the process, we found out that Matt had a problem with alcohol and drugs and that he was abusive to Liz. So that really became the focus of our work together to make sure that Matt stayed clean and sober, and to make sure that nobody got hurt, and also to make sure that the children were taken care of. Ashley, Justin, Autumn, and Nicholas. I worked with this family for six years. 
See, I watched this cycle many times. It was pretty typical. Matt would get drunk. He'd lose control. He'd beat up Liz and leave, sometimes for days. Liz's bruises would heal. And Matt would come home. He'd get clean and sober and say he was sorry. And he always, always, always promised he'd never do it again. And then something would happen. It would explode. And unfortunately, each time, there became a little less time between those promises. Oh, but this last time, something different happened. Liz said, I want you out. Your promises are empty. This time, she decided she was filing for the permanent protection order and that she was going to make it stick, not having any idea what was going on in Matt's mind. I got the call at home, a frantic neighbor. Are you sitting down? Last night, while Liz's mother was babysitting the children, Matt broke in and murdered them. What? He broke in, he murdered June, and he slit Ashley and Autumn's throats. He said he left the boys to spread his seed. My husband says he never wants to hear me scream like that again. The sound of a wounded animal from a place so deep inside me I didn't even know was there. How could I have missed this? As social workers, we are trained to self-evaluate. How did I not see this coming? Who did I think I was to sit in this office and call myself a social worker? I began to question everything about my life and my work. Liz called me. The funeral is Wednesday. And I went to the florist and I had these little baby dolls with blonde hair and pink roses made and Liz stood with me at the casket. She supported me. I said, thank you for letting me know. And she said, Ashley would have had it any other way. Well, I broke down and called a teacher and former teacher and supervisor because I really couldn't handle this by myself. And he said to me, Colleen, you are an awesome social worker. We do not have control over the things that people do to each other or the violence in the world. All we can do is be the best that we can be, and you are that, and I will help you through this. And together, through therapy and reflection and journaling, he helped me through it. See, Liz and the boys walk in grief, and over two years later, I continue to walk with them. Liz mothers those children with such love and care, and little Justin found his resilience in changing his last name. He did it unofficially the day his family was killed, and today it is legal. And we are all healing, slow and steady. And as we walk, Ashley sits right here on my shoulders. She's my guardian angel. And let me tell you, she must be, because I didn't think I deserved to be a social worker anymore, and I certainly didn't think I wanted to be a social worker anymore. But here I am. And if you think I'm happy about my job, uh, I am. See, it is my pleasure to go into people's homes and become a part of the fabric of their lives, to be trusted to keep their stories. It is my honor, it is my pleasure and my joy, and it makes me who I am. But besides, Ashley wouldn't have it any other way. I think that domestic violence is the most equal um, experience that women can have. There is no distinction uh, from one household to another. Yes, what happens is different, but what happens to the woman is pretty much the same, whether you come from a, a hard working class family or from an academic family or from a wealthy family. And I met my husband-to-be. He was very intelligent and very funny and also handsome. We were married and spent 15 
blissful years together, during which time we had four children and did a lot of traveling. But my husband became restless and he became more and more absent from home. And all of a sudden, the foul language and the accusation and the blaming started. And before you know it, the domestic violence and the hitting and the shoving into a refrigerator. And then he almost broke my wrist. It went on and on every week. There was something new and violent. I could take it if it was a stranger, but this is the man that I trusted, that I loved. He's the father of my children. And he was my best friend. Why doesn't she leave is like the worst possible question you can ask an abuse victim or the worst possible message that we as a society can send. It is not about the victim leaving. It's about society finally saying enough is enough. This is not okay. Sometimes this is kind of like an unfair question. I said because the men don't get asked that question, you know, not only why doesn't he leave, but why doesn't he stop hitting her? I guess, you know, some of the reasons why I didn't leave um, my relationship with Robert, there's, there was many reasons in, in a sense. Um, of course, you know, fear of being, you know, one of the number one factors, you know, always in the bottom of, you know, your stomach, you always feel fear for the worst or something horrible to happen. There's the, the self-esteem. That can really rub on a person, and it did on me. Uh, when you're always told you're a dilettant, oh no, you can't do this, no, your English isn't good enough, no, you are too thin, or uh, you're supposed to stay in the kitchen. You're too fat, you're too ugly, you're too stupid, uh, you are worthless. After a while you start believing it, and then you feel that way, you feel inadequate, you feel that uh, you, your self-esteem goes down, 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 until you indeed look and feel like a little gray mouse. You don't feel strong enough that, you know, a lot of times, they, you know, they, they break you down so much where you don't feel capable of doing something like, you know, being able to keep yourself safe, protect yourself. I think that emotional abuse and physical abuse are so, um, People struggle with them on different levels because physical abuse is so tangible. A hit is a hit. A kick is a kick. A bite is a bite. You can't deny pain of that nature. You, you have physical sensations. You can't deny them. It's trickier, I think, for me anyways, it's trickier to so quickly identify when someone is hurting your soul or hurting your spirit, or hurting your mind, because you can make excuses. And the biggest excuse, and it's not even really an excuse, is questioning, well, maybe it isn't really what I think it is. Maybe I'm misinterpreting that comment. So I'm hoping if I can, that there's a way I can really make them understand that it doesn't have to be that way, that a woman is not made to be abused because she's a daughter of God, and God did not put us here to be abused. In Africa, when you come out and tell, when people know that your husband is abusing you, it's, it's like a belief. People think that it's your fault. I was being abused by my husband. In my country of Burundi, the cow is the symbol of wealth. The cow provides milk and food and helps to cultivate the fields. A good cow brings much wealth to the family and is believed to be as valuable as a good daughter. In my land of Burundi, daughters live with their family. They are the ones who cook, carry water from the river, watch the young ones clean and take care of the home. To lose a daughter to marriage 
is to lose something as valuable as a cow. When the father gives up his daughter in marriage to another family, he wants to make sure that she will be well taken care of, valued for her wealth. When I was presented to my husband, I was the most valuable gift. My abuser was destroying me. I was now allowed to be myself. I was now allowed to be who I felt like God wanted me to be. So I was now allowed to express myself. I was crying out. And I was, at the same time, I was showing how hurt I was. Almost like I was destroying the basket. I was being destroyed. You need to get something out of your heart when it's hurting you because if it stays in there, it's going to get even worse. I haven't been to, to Africa since I've been separated from my husband. So I'm looking forward to go there to see how, because I know, there's a, I know a lot of women who are going through the same thing, but there's no way out. They don't get the support that I, I got here. So I'm not ashamed anymore because I'd rather do bed by myself than just watch myself getting destroyed when I can do something about it. I learned I'm here to do, to accomplish something the way God wants me to do it, not the way somebody else wants me to do it. I grew up in a beautiful land, fields of corn, sugar cane, tomato plantation. There were mango trees, rivers, Mountains. Outside was all wild, beautiful and free. But in their home, there is always violence. My father beats my mother. My grandfather beats grandmother. Uncle beats him. Mother beats me. And no one speaks about it. It's everywhere. In my family, father was the king. Mother was the queen. We, the children, were nothing. I was nothing. I have a smart mouth. I say no. I run and hide in the bushes. But mom beats me more. I didn't wash the dishes clean enough. She holds my hands over fire and burns them. She curses me. She punishes me. She throws me across the floor through the wall. She throws me cans and shoes. She wrestles me until my face turns purple. She beats to kill. I am knocked down, unconscious. And when I wake up, there is a broom stuck up my vagina. I am unconscious, but I feel the pain. I lie naked, raped by my mother. God will protect her because I'm such a bad child. She sent me to church to pray for my sins. Three services a weekend. But in church, I hear music. I hear the teacher said that things are different from my mother or the priest. I know she isn't right. My mom is no God. I live home. I have only sixth grade education. And I'm too stupid to go to school. But I become a maid for my end. Then a factory worker at age 17. I meet Luis. We were only 16. 
But I have promised myself that the first man I see, I live with him. He has to be strong to fight with my mother. He can take me somewhere. He can save my life. But he beat me too. I live on fear of him. After our first daughter is born, we separate. And I cannot raise a child alone my own in El Salvador. I have nothing. Luis bring her to his mother. And I see that this woman will raise her with the same abuse she raised my husband. I come back to the marriage and find our own place to live. But Luis and I didn't stay. The war in my country got worse. People were being tortured and murdered. Luis got a death threat from the government, and he had to escape. My brother is in the US. The only way that Luis could get in is if I go with him. We left our three children and walk across mountains and desert with no food or water, only sand. My feet were bleeding. People were soaking water from mud. I, I was so exhausted that I let down and wanted to give up. All around men were on the sand crying. But Luis wouldn't let me die. He yelled at me, what kind of mother leave her three children and die in the desert? What will I tell your children? I was so exhausted that I say, I don't care anymore. But Luis wouldn't give up. He kept yelling at me until he got me mad enough to get up. And I make him promise me to leave me as soon as we got to Houston. And then we were captured, beaten, and sent to a refugee camp. I stopped speaking. I became mute. Eventually, we were sponsored by the political sanctuary movement in Philadelphia and came to Philadelphia. I got my children back. I started working for peace, learning English. I know I only have sixth grade education, and I don't speak real sentences, but I know I can think. I know I can fix. I know I can make my kids, Luis, and myself happy. I know I can dance. I can see the beauty of natural life. I see things no many people can see. People say that because I was abused, I will become an abuser. They say that because I didn't have a father, I will raise my kids as a single woman. They say that because I was raped, I will become a rapist. But I am here to prove to you that that isn't true. I am a good daughter, mother, wife. I am a good human being. I have raised my family with love. No, no one can take away the beauty of me. How can my mother or my husband take away the beauty of a woman? No, no one can take away the beauty of me. Thank you, Sonia. The time of, uh, of pain is over when you made it, you made it through the pain.
I was supposed to be the one to save her. I was supposed to be the one to give it all the love and respect she never got as a child. I was supposed to be the one to say her beauty, but I failed. One day, I saw myself in the whole mirror. I saw my own face, but it wasn't me. I saw the face of a monster. I saw the face of someone who was beating Sonia. She was hiding in the closet, and the kids were screaming. I don't know how I got there. I look in the mirror, and I ask, who is that person? How can that monster can be me? Growing up in El Sabo, I was taught to be the man, to be the king, the dominator. I was taught that women serve men, and that men can hit women and children. That violence is the only way to resolve conflict. I learned it well. I was also taught abuse by my mother, who beat me for hours for losing a white shirt, who burned my hands and broke my fingers because I was too slow in learning the alphabet, who beat me to near death. I learned to manipulate to get what I want, to always stay on top so my power isn't threat. But when Sonia talks back or somebody threatens my manhood, my, I feel my head heat up, my stomach become ice. The next thing I know, I explode. It's like a being a thunderstorm, a thermal, real, a thermal reaction in my chest of heat and cold, destroying everything and everyone. One is a star. I can't stop it. The only relief is in hitting. Once, I was the one to say something. We were in the desert, men on their knees and hands crying. She was exhausted, laying on sand, growing men trying to drink water from mud. She wanted to give up and die, but I would not let her. That was the closest I ever felt to another human being. It was like we were one person, one breath, of, one breath away from death. At that moment, my only reason was to save her. I got her angry on purpose because I knew if she got get mad enough, she will get up and keep walking to our freedom. I didn't care about myself. At that moment, the only reason for me was to keep her alive. I will die there in a minute to save her. I always will die to save her. I had looked in the mirror. And I see who has to die. It's the monster. It's the violent one. It's the damaged part inside of me that is so scared of losing control. That he is so scared that he had to hit the person he must love in the world. I had looked the monster in the eye and said, look, it's time for you to go away. So I can see in the mirror the man I was meant to be, a good father, a good husband, a good human being. Root of violence run deep inside of me, but so does my commitment to my family, to my children, and so does my commitment to change. This is not easy, but I have to do it. I have to use all my honesty and hard work to turn my back to some parts of my culture that told me that it's okay to be my wife. I had to keep my hands in my pocket. I had to stop drinking and arguing for me, as well for my family. Sometimes I feel I'm carrying the guilt of every man that has committed domestic violence. But I know I had to forgive myself. I need help, and I got help. Now I want to reach out other men and help them to save their life and the life of those they love. Sonia is more beautiful now to me than she ever was. I see a woman of great courage, stamina, and intelligence. She gave me the greatest gift a man can have. Three wonderful children and the love of a beautiful woman. I want to be worthy of that love. And I pray every day that I will. So she and I can live together and love and peace. Like the 
I believe people say that I'm brave to do this, but I don't feel that as being brave. I think it's part of the process of learning to be a human being and trying to see deep inside of myself that I have a problem. And if I had cancer, I would try to do something to survive and, you know, and, and, and live. And I think what I have inside of me, the violence, is almost the same. And I had to do something to get rid of it. I mean, I want to live in peace. So working with men in need of healing who were coming to the, to the office primarily because they were abusive to their wives or girlfriends was the first thing I noticed was you would see a rough exterior. Most often, most guys who were, you know, carrying themselves in a pretty rigid kind of way. The therapy helps in many ways. I think the therapy helped to control myself and to restrain my violence and to analyze my behavior. Um, also having to get in some medicine, some, you know, some medicine to take to control the, the chemical balance in my body. Um, it helps a lot, but it's it's very hard to find a person who really wants to work with you in that department to, to try to drag the monster out of you. Success is, is tough, I'm not gonna lie. Success is really, really tough to get somebody who's willing to kind of go all the way, because quite a few gentlemen do drop out. Society is responsible to help the victim, but it's more responsible to help and try to resolve the problem from the other side of the abuser. I oftentimes saw success stories when, when the women left, when they didn't stay with, with the men at times. There was a few that, that would hang in there, but when the women left, for some guys, this was really motivation saying, well, I'm gonna really put myself in the hopper and clean myself up so I can be a, a, a brand new me, so to speak. Living with me is like living with an alcoholic person that any man is going to mess, you know, their life. And living with me is, is, is the same thing, and I see in her, I see in her the, the fear. I really want to leave him. I really want to walk out of that door so many times after the play. And I have said it to him, it's not because I don't love him, it's because the pain, I feel the pain, I feel the I feel those eyes, those expressions, you know, the sounds there. It's almost virtually impossible, I think, to not change if, if you want to do something different about what you had brought to the table. So, and that was a chance, because some guys would try to tap dance around and, you know, well, let me just, yeah, I want to be, I want to, I want this person back and I don't want to hit her again. But you know, you didn't just hit her out of isolation. This hitting her was in connection with a lot of other stuff. It didn't just come on its own. You began calling her names usually, you began feeling that she kind of deserved and you deserving of some of this behavior and 
and you were top dog, so you need to look at all of this kind of stuff in order for this hitting to stop. She comes at me and she's crying and she's shaking. And she knows I hate that! So I tell her to shut up! But she doesn't. So I hit her. Get out! See what you made me do? She's still crying, so I push her. Next thing I know, someone must have called 911 and the cops are after me. But something's missing. Details, feelings, empathy. How bad was she hurt, sir? It wasn't that bad. It really wasn't that bad. It wasn't that much blood. Did she have to be hospitalized, sir? Yeah, but it was only for a few days. worker and he's the one who has to do the work. Those that don't leave. But for those who stay, it's a dance. We teach them about power and control. About oppressive regimes. About guys liking to get their own way. Trying to get them to develop some empathy. It's important for them to fess up and be honest about what they did, but then when you got to work with who this person is, who's this spirit, who's this individual that is walking in your office, you begin to see some similarities. You begin to see some men who, at little boys, had some hurts of their own, some pretty vicious hurts, and they would cover up even the hurts that they had. I was hurt, but my mom was a good mom. I was a bad boy. Sometimes I wouldn't do the dishes when I asked. I should have just not been so bad. Once I was hitting the head with an iron. Once locked in the closet. I mean, she used to let her boyfriends beat me up. There's a tear running down his face. There's an open, a crack. Chink, or maybe not. And we dance. It's work, you know, it's not like, and it's kind of work that you don't like see right away. I like, you know, you have a cold, and they say if you take cold, put all this pressure over years and years, it, it becomes a diamond. Well, that's similar. You may have this piece of coal come in your office, and if you just look at it at that, then you might. You might go, ow, you might not want to work with them, and then, God forbid, if the person is a little abrasive or abusive to you, then you have to work through what they just did with you and wash that off and say, okay, listen, let's start this over. Let's start this over. And, you know, and say, okay, this is what this person could be. Some of these guys come in the door, and you know it's going to be a long road, a long road. But we never give up on them. Never. You know, because healing happens in mysterious ways. It seems like something's not happening. And then all of a sudden, a man, a woman, a child finds that place inside of them where the natural tendency to be whole and good is. They find the strength to face the pain, to grow. It's 
It's a beauty to be a witness to that. Sheer beauty. I have utmost love and respect for, for Luis. And I have, you know, of course, visions that he'd be the ideal person that could be doing some men's work, you know, and I know he does professionally other kinds of work that pays his bill, but I, I think, you know, he's not a social worker or whatever, but he is a living embodiment of what some men, I think, could experience and mentor and be connected with. When, when I would be sitting behind, you know, backstage when, before my part and everyone else was going, you know, doing their parts. Um, and like I said, some days more than others, I would be even more emotional and, you know, probably cry behind, you know. Um, but, yeah, it would just bring up a lot. And I guess just in some ways possibly even prepare me for mine, you know. I set this place in honor of my daughter, Caitlin Rivera Helton, whose life was taken by her father in an act of domestic violence. At 20 months old, she was so full of life and very bright. She loved to eat, especially red tomatoes and popsicle. She also liked to share her food with the dogs. I would sit across from her at the table and she would be smiling at me so innocently while her little hand would go down and she would share her food with the dogs. She was just starting to speak in sentences and she spoke well. She would sit with me on the step and pretend like she was eating and say to me, want some, Mommy? Want some? Although these memories are very short-lived, I'm very thankful and will always hold them very near and dear to my heart. Caitlin, my sunshine, I don't think you know the whole story between me and your father. But I think you deserve to know. And I feel ready to share it with you tonight. When I first met your father, he was too good to be true. He would court me with flowers, take me out to dinner, nights out in the town. He always had the right words to say for the right times. He knew how to make me laugh. He treated me pretty well, but that didn't last very long. As soon as he realized that I loved him was when the verbal abuse started. And shortly after I became pregnant with you was when the physical violence began. He used to punch me, pinch me. Sometimes he would beat me while I was already on the ground. The worst was when you witnessed it. One thing to beat me, but to allow you to endure watching and screaming in pure terror was a whole nother story. One time, he threatened to kill me and bury me in line. Another time, he held me in the apartment with his hands over my mouth telling me, shut up, I can take your life right now. I started to feel the breath in me get weak. Shortly after was when we left and I went to the courthouse and obtained a protection from abuse order. And then we went to live with Aunt Janie and Uncle John, and then with Mama and Papa. And I know those were the best two weeks of your life. I could see you were so much more free and happier. The last time that I saw you was on the morning of August 10th, 1999. I had to be in court that morning for the prior assault and I had taken you to daycare. After court, I went to the Wawa with Aunt Jane, and your father came in and started talking to me. So I went back to the car, and your father opened the door and grabbed me by my throat and carried me to the middle of the parking lot, where he got me down, got a hold of my hair, and started dragging me around the parking lot. His eyes were filled with rage. He looked like the devil. And Janie got on top of me trying to get me free, but he just drug us both around. Finally, I got free, and your father got in the car and drove away. And I knew in my heart that he was going to get you. So I told Aunt Janie, hurry up, 
tell mom and papa to go get Caitlin right away. But it was too late. When they arrived, your father had already busted the door down and taken you away. Just recently, we went to trial, and your father was found guilty of your murder with no body. And he's now serving a life sentence plus 27 years. More and more since this happened, I want to be the voice that you never had the chance to be. The Lord allowed me to keep my life that day when I thought so harshly I was going to die in your father's hands. And for that, I vowed my life to helping other women and children out of the relationship before things would ever get this tragedy. I want justice for you, Caitlin, and all the women and children out there have lost their lives to domestic violence. I think of you now, and I see you now, as my bright light, my little angel guiding me through life. And I will do many, many good things in your name. Before I go, I want to share with you one last memory that I really hold dear. Caitlin would run to the refrigerator and she would ask me, she would say, Mom, I want a poppy, Monty. And I'd say, okay, Caitlin, and I'd give her a popsicle. And she'd say, more, Monty. And I'd say, okay, Caitlin, one more. She'd say, no, Monty, two more. <laughs> and I wish we could add so many more. my part you know especially you know being able to talk to Caitlin in heaven was was really the best way to do it because um, I did feel really really close to her and, and each time before I would go on I would always pray and you know ask her guardian angel to let her come through and so many times that I noticed you know even if it was someone in the audience wanting to give me a hug or something that that that, that was her way of being there with me and you know and I think that's another reason why I was so unbelievably emotional, you know, because it's a totally different way of telling my story. To raise my voices, be free. Get, don't hide yourself no more, you be free. We were out there and we were loud and it wasn't a quiet, we're telling a story. We're raising our voice so that you hear, hear us, feel us. Raising my voice was Liberation, it was an um, opportunity to, to speak up what had happened to me in life. So when I say raising our voice, I literally feel like I'm being raised up and I helped others be raised up because I told the story. I set this place in memory of Ashley and Autumn. May their spirits always guide us. This place is set in memory of all my sisters whose places are now empty at their tables. And this place is also set for my sisters who have found love in the arms of another woman and they have found violence and pain in the, at the hands of that same woman. They say it doesn't happen in our community, but it does, and we need to raise our voice. And I said this plate for all my sisters back in my homeland of Burundi in Africa who are still struggling with domestic violence, and they are stuck in their homes because they cannot speak their voice. I pray that one day they will find the strength and the peace they are, they are all looking for. I'm here in behalf of those who had the courage to face the fear to ask for help. On behalf of those who are working in healthy and happy marriages. On behalf of those who are working hard to stop domestic violence. I give to the world two beautiful young black men filled with love and peace. And I bring the gift of forgiveness. I keep the stories for those who didn't survive. I bring the truth. I bring honesty and hard work. Humility 
and love for all of the children on this world. I bring laughter, dancing, and joy. And I bring the vibrant spirit of my daughter, Caitlin, and the spirit of all those who carry us on. Our voices, loud and clear, deep and full, with prayers, songs, and praise. This is what we bring to the table. Won't you join us? As rich as the material um, that was presented in Raising Our Voice is, um, we're aware that it's not the whole story, that it could never be the whole story. We had eight players to work with, and as much as their stories are rich and they are courageous people, um, there are stories that we're not, we were not able to tell in the format that we had, and voices that have yet to be heard, as well as some issues that we felt were important to address. What follows is our attempt to reflect on those issues and to give a voice, at least indirectly, to some of those other stories that have yet to be told. Especially for my community, the lesbian community, we don't talk about it. Women don't hit women is sort of the myth, and that's exactly what it is, a big, big myth, because lots of women hit me. I think the dynamics of abuse between a lesbian couple or a heterosexual couple are very parallel, very similar. Abuse is abuse, whether a man is doing it or whether a woman is doing it. I think where the differences really come into play is when you're going to seek services. I think for me, it was very easy to call the shelter when I was saying, my husband, I need to seek shelter from my husband. I didn't call the shelter when the woman was hitting me because I was too afraid to say, a woman is hitting me. I'm being hurt by a woman. Because in saying that, I outed myself, and then you had all of that stuff to deal with. So I think it's really, for the service community, a huge issue 
that we have to grapple with in terms of making sure our staff are sensitive, they're trained to be able to communicate with lesbians and gays, that our literature, our posters, our office, our environment reflects them. We make them visible too. Because if you make me visible, if I walk in your office and I see a poster that says lesbians hit too, you've welcomed me. It's really important to remember that males are victims of domestic violence as well. And that is true both in heterosexual and gay relationships. And I think it's, there. granted it's a minority, if you look at statistics, it's a statistical minority, but it's still a population that needs to be heard and needs to be recognized. And I think it's sometimes very difficult for male victims to be recognized because they think they're supposed to be the ones who are in control and strong. And I think just as it can be difficult for a lesbian or gay victim to go sometimes to a service provider, so I think it's equally challenging for male victims. One of the stories that I think was told effectively in the piece was the story that involves individuals who experienced abuse as children and how that had an impact in, in their lives. Um, there needs to be more told about that story. The children in these homes see the violence, hear the violence, and are often affected directly by the violence themselves in terms of physical abuse. But those who only witness it, if they're not physically abused themselves, witnessing it is devastating and has its impact as well. We think that they don't look, they don't think, they are not seen because they are a child, they are just baby, but they are, they are learning, they are assimilating a lot what's going on. Despite the fact that maybe the child is not being physically abused, that the domestic violence is not happening to the child. The child is experiencing that violence in a way, in a developmental sense, that is very painful and very critical and very damaging to that child and will ultimately lead to damage. I just read Mike's son's essay for his college application and I was blown away because it started by saying, imagine before you're five, living in a shelter because your dad beat your mom up. Imagine laying in bed at night hating him. I was so wrapped up in my own stuff, in my own hate, in my own need to forgive. I was totally unaware that my children were going through a forgiveness process. When someone tries to heal from the effects of domestic violence, there's no one right way. There's no roadmap. In some respects, it would be a lot easier if there was a roadmap for any victim of any kind of abuse. Um, everyone's process, it is a process, and everyone's process is different. i still working on my anger. My anger it was after the play got out of hand. But with work, with you and Bill, our friend psychiatry, had helped me to get out of there, of the anger. I think what's helped me to you know heal over time um, is basically time itself, um, the support of my family, you know, in a sense, and friends, and also doing um, something like this performance, or um, a lot of times I'll do presentations for school, and, and I'll do my paper based on my you know my story so it's another way for me to get that out there and in any other avenues that I can go you know as far as getting my story out there really it does does help me I think the healing is still going on in some respects um, and I think that there are some parts that will never heal I get it all the time you know because even for my family it's a struggle sometimes you know um, for them to understand you know, where I was and why I didn't leave and, and why I put up with so much and, and why I lied to them and, you know, all these different things and why I continue to um, defend women, you know, in situations like that or, or t uh, talk about this to people. But it's basically because, you know, I don't know where they are in their process where, you know, everyone's different and they could be at that breaking point where they just need, you know, some, to hear a story like mine or any of them in this piece and have the strength you know, to 
to know that they can move on and they, you know, there is life after abuse and they can do this. And, um, and then even if it's not, if it's not, you know, right in their process, eventually at some point, you know, figure by at least telling them and setting it in their mind, you know, at some point when it is their time, then, then, you know, it may just be that, that, that will help them. I, I'm very, uh, I'm a strong believe, I'm a very spiritual and I truly believe in my, my in my higher power, but in God's power, which is higher than me. And by singing, by dancing, it's, it's just a strength that comes in inside of me. And just by dancing, it, it really lifts up my spirit. One of the things that really um, was important to convey in this piece is not simply the the abuse and the violence and the tragedy, but that this is a story of survival. That was really important to those, those, those of us involved in the project. Um, the eight stories told here, these are all strong, courageous persons um, who survived. And you know what made for their survival might be different in different cases. Certainly it's clear that, that Lillian is a woman of faith. Um, for others, it may have been other people in their lives that provided them some, some balance. Um, there, there are different things that, that make for resilience and that make for survival. But one of the messages that we really wanted to convey is that everybody has hope and that we've given sufficient support to everybody has the opportunity to get out of an abusive life. And the best thing for someone who is a support person or who loves someone or who knows someone who's going through this kind of violence in their home is to be exactly that. Be a support person. Be a shelter in the storm. Be a safety plan for them. Be a person they can call and, and discuss things with. Be a person they can run to if things get out of control. Be a person that a victim can leave their children with in the event that things are really ugly at home. Be a person who's not judging them for why they stay, but helping them build enough self-esteem to realize that they don't have to take it anymore. One of the things that occurred in part because of the collection of stories that we had was the message in some respects that was communicated by many of, of the players that they took action. They sought to stop the abuse when that abuse began to affect directly impact their children when their children were knocked into the toilet or their child was grabbed around the throat. And one of the things that I think is really important for all of us to recognize and for us to find ways to support victims of domestic violence is that they don't need to wait until the violence has had its trickle-down effect and begins to affect the children. That why is it that we often don't value ourselves sufficiently to be able to say, no, you can't do this before the children are hurt. When I met everybody, you know, I was really scared to death. Um, but when I started knowing and, and hearing and talking and, and I started to feel a very connection with, you know, Everybody and I and I felt very connected with everybody in that sense because every single story was part of me, except except the the killing, but I know that was one step away or two step away to do something really really wrong. So I feel very connected with everybody and like I said, I felt all the time on the other side of the story, you know, um, and it started to make me feel very confident to be part of the group. And there was a moment in a rehearsal where Luis and I were talking, just talking, and somehow, and I think I was kind of mean to <laughs> Luis, but um, I had very sharp words with him about forgiving himself. And I don't remember the details of the conversation and, and word for word, but I remember the feeling um, because Luis had such a unique position in the cast of being a male and being a, a male abuser. And um, I remember wanting to hold him and ease his pain and say, forgive yourself, 
because I've forgiven you. And through the act of forgiving Leonard, it was like I had forgiven. I had the capacity anyways to forgive any person that had perpetuated violence. And I just remember wanting to take Luis in my arms and hold him and say, please forgive yourself, please, because I have forgiven you. And I think that was, um, Luis and I never spoke about it, but something happened. And so the other day, it just occurred to me, I somehow, like, it was a little voice telling me, Erica, how about forgive and remember? And I've been thinking about that ever since. I can't stop for, uh, remembering. It's there, it's inside, it won't go away, it's there. But the forgiving is something that I have finally grasped. And now I want to remember that I have forgiven. And I've forgiven myself. And it's all right. And when there are times when I get angry and I remember the hurt and the pain, I tell myself, remember you have forgiven. One of the things I was most concerned about was not to have all the passion and energy love, other things that were part of the process of developing the theater piece, have all of that lost when the curtain came down on the final performance. It was really important to me to, to make sure that these voices aren't silenced because the curtain came down, that these voices can be heard over and over and over again.